mentirre como a mis antepasados. No quiero que a mí me entierre como a mis antepasados. En el vientre oscuro y fresco de una cinta de mar. En el vientre oscuro y fresco. It is a, a widely accepted fact that the bulk of the ancestors of the ancient Taino people of the Caribbean islands migrated into the region from mainland South America. The majority of those migrants originated in the forests surrounding the banks of the great Orinoco River and its tributaries in Venezuela and Guyana. The languages spoken by those people belong to two great linguistic families of the region, Arawakan and Cariban. The Dane language belongs to the great Arawakan language family. Most researchers familiar with the culture of the ancient Caribbean island Taino agree that the best way to form a more complete picture of their ancient spiritual beliefs is to compare what has been written by 15th century chroniclers about the tradition with what is known of modern day Arawakan and Caribbean spiritual traditions of the Orinoco. There is a, a Caribbean indigenous nations still living on the banks of the Orinoco in Venezuela called the Maquiritari, uh, also known as the Yekuana, whose spiritual tradition is encapsulated in the fabric of a complex oral creation narrative called Watuna. An in-depth exposition of Watuna was presented by the French researcher Marc Sivriou, and published in Spanish in 1970. The book is called Guatuna, an Orinoco Creation Cycle. This book was later translated to English and published by the author David Gus. The world acclaimed mythologist Joseph Campbell discovered a rich substrata of wisdom in Watuna that related directly to Taino legends. The material in Watuna, along with similar traditions from neighboring tribes, obviously formed the basis for a wide range of themes found in Taino sacred narratives. It is obvious that this fount of indigenous sacred tradition is one of the several sources explored by various other researchers such as Jose Juan Arrom and Sebastián Robiu Lamarche as they explored the links between island tradition and mainland tradition. Cane indigenous and spiritual circle have been inspired by the study of Watuna carried out by these scholars and feel that it presents us with a wonderful vehicle via which to arrive at a deeper understanding of the inner messages hidden within the sacred creation narrative of our own Taino ancestors, bequeathed to us 500 years ago. Watuna is a long, complicated series of orally narrated cycles. Since it is a living tradition, it has continued to evolve naturally, without pause, right down from its ancient pre-Columbian beginnings, straight through the Spanish conquest and directly into modern times. As time and history has impacted the Maquiritare people, the story has morphed and adapted with changes. It has acquired new themes that are relevant to the interactions between the Maquiritare 
and the colonial Spanish, as well as the latter European descendants who now dominate Venezuelan society. That said, the contemporary version of Watuna that Severio presented to the world in 1970 is still fundamentally the legitimate product of the indigenous mind. It maintains its native roots very intact and provides us with a valuable window into the true meaning of the more obscure concepts hidden in the mythology of related traditions, including our own Taino culture. Among the most notable elements of Watuna that interest us as Taino is the series of episodes surrounding a character called Frimene. The story of Frimene was singled out by Campbell as the most obvious reference in Watuna to a personality that can be identified with the Taino legendary character called Atabe and her earthly manifestation, Itiba Kahubaba. The writings of Ramon Pane identify Atabe as a divine maternal entity. Itiba Kahubaba is identified as the mother of the ancestral quadruplets, which include Teminan Karakarakol and his three brothers, reputed by some to have been the original founders of the Taino nation. Itiba Kahubaba is said to have died during childbirth. Frimene also gives her life at the moment when she gives birth to multiple children. Campbell notes that a number of researchers, including Jose Juan Arron, have identified linguistic associations in the Arawakan language family between the word atabe and words that make reference to water as well as bodies of water such as rivers and lakes. That is important because Frimene is also considered a mistress of the waters. There are many other aspects of Frimene's identity that seem to be related to Atabe. As early as the 1960s, the scholar Eugenio Fernandez Mendez indicated in his book, Art and the Mythology of the Taino Indians of the Greater West Indies, that one of the most important animals that the ancient Taino people associated with their maternal deity Atabe was serpents. In Watuna, it becomes very obvious that the most fundamental animal identity of Frimene is the anaconda snake, a constrictor that typically spends a great deal of time in rivers and other bodies of water. Further insight into this uh, serpent connection can be arrived at if one recognizes Atabe to be not only a water matriarch but also an anthropomorphic representation of the earth. With Atabe in the role of Mother Earth, it can be assumed that any opening on the surface of the earth, such as a cave, can be interpreted as being an opening to her birth canal, through which she can give birth to the elements of creation. And sure enough, one of the episodes in the Taino creation narrative does indeed include the birth of the sun and the moon out of a cave called Iguana Boina, a word that has been interpreted by some researchers to mean brown serpent. In Watuna, the Makiritare narrator of the story refers to Frimene's vagina as her cave. We will present here the cycle of episodes in Watuna that make reference to Frimene and related elements of the story. We will note the many parallels between this narration and our own Taino creation tale. By the way of introduction, the fundamental premise of the Watuna story is the struggle between the supreme male deity Wanadi as he repeatedly attempts to bring human life upon the earth and a demonic entity called Odosha who strives to defeat him in that task. Wanadi's work on the surface of the earth is carried out by a series of incarnations of himself whom he sends down to earth from his dwelling place in heaven. 
One of the earliest terrestrial manifestations of Wanadi creates a race of humans who inhabit the earth for a brief period of time in peace and harmony. But eventually, Odosha comes along and teaches these humans to commit murder. This causes them to lose their humanity. They turn into the many animals of the forest. After that, the bulk of the story is spent telling the adventures of Wanadi and these animal people. Having been defeated, the first manifestation of Wanadi returns to heaven and a second one is sent down. And then another, and another still. One of the latter Wanadi manifestation notices that there is no food on the earth and thus the animal people are all starving. Taking pity on them, this being causes a giant tree called Maharwaka to grow at the center of the earth, from whose branches grow all plants, plant foods such as yucca, manioc, and maize, and all fruits. Initially, this tree is too tall for the animals to reach the food hanging from its branches, but eventually the problem is solved when the great tree falls and all the food finally hits the ground. The animals are saved from starvation, but it is important to note that this solution is not entirely satisfactory for carnivores such as the jaguar. Having failed in his initial attempt to create humanity, Wanadi causes the creation of a fabulous primordial egg-like object called Wehana. This object contains the seminal form of all future human beings. These seminal humans exist within that egg-like thing, within the context of a miniature community, going about their everyday lives and celebrating festivals and ceremonies with joyous music and dance, which can actually be heard by anyone who gets close to the egg. The problem with all this is that Huehana, the egg, needs a female womb in which to gestate and it will not hatch by itself unless it, it is enclosed inside such a womb. Wanadi sends a new manifestation of himself back down to earth with the Huehana egg. This new earth Wanadi seeks out the assistance of a female divinity who consents to hold the egg inside her womb and be the mother of humanity. Unfortunately, Odosha finds out and sends an accomplice to destroy this would-be mother. He recruits a lizard and hands him a lethal weapon. This weapon is a gourd in which he has deposited his own potently corrosive poison urine. The lizard sneaks up on the divine female and tosses the deadly object at her. The gourd breaks upon striking the female deity and the urine quickly destroys her physical body and so her soul flies off to live in a sacred lake. When the earth Wanadi returns, all he finds is a pile of smoking bones. He gives up and returns to heaven, taking the Huehana egg with him. He places the egg in a storage place on the guard and withdraws from the action. The episode that we will share here begins with the efforts of a new version of earth Wanadi called Atawanadi to hatch the Huehana egg so he can populate the earth with humans. This new earth Wanadi makes the mistake of taking into his confidence another divinity of the Makiritare pantheon. This other divinity is Nuna, the male manifestation of the moon. The problem with Nuna is that he's a cannibal and he becomes obsessed with the desire to steal the Huehana egg and eat all the people inside. Here is the narration, just as the Makiritare storytellers told it 
to Syria. That man at the Wanadi found very few people on the earth when he came. They were all under Odosha. He told Nuna the moon, I'm going to make people. I'll go back to heaven and ask for Huihana. Good, said Nuna. I want people too. Okay, answered at the Wanadi. When I get Huihana, I'll give you your own people. Good, he said. Now he thought to himself, how many people is Wanadi going to give me? I better go get Wahana myself. He was Huhai. He went to Kuhunya, to the highest part of heaven, up to the door of the Wanadi. From there, a door never opens. No one goes into the house. No one sees Wanadi. You can only speak to the guards at the door. Nuna lied when he got there. I'm Wanadi, the one from the earth, he said. I came from Wehana. I'm going to make people there. The guards told Wanadi, the real Wanadi, the one that sits in heaven. Uh, Wanadi, I think Wanadi's here. He wants Wehana. Okay, says Wanadi. The guards called Nuna, whom they thought was Atawanani, to the door, and they gave him the Huehana egg. Nuna went down happy. He wanted people like Wanadi, but just didn't eat them. He was hungry. He was evil. He thought like Mado the Jaguar. There's no food? Okay. I'll eat people. That's the way his evilness got started. Now the real Atawanadi arrived. I want to make people on earth. I want Huehana. The guards said again. We just gave it to you. I don't know. Atawanadi answered. I don't know anything. We gave it to you, they said. And they didn't give him anything. The real after Wanadi went back down to earth again thinking, they've been tricked. Someone stole Huehana. When Nuna got home, he thought, I'm going to eat. That man's sister lived in the same house. She was a beautiful young girl. Her name was Frimene. Where were you? What's that? I was in Cahunia, he said. This is Wehana. It's beautiful. It looks like a Tinamu egg, the girl said. Wehana was buzzing like a beehive. People were dancing and singing inside. I want it, the girl thought. It's filled with people who haven't been born yet. She knew Nuna had stolen that egg. I can't let him eat them. I'll save them. I'll keep them myself. I don't want to give them back to Nuna or to Wanadi. I'm going to raise them. I'll hatch them. I'll be their mother. That's what the girl thought to herself when she saw Wehana. She didn't say anything. She just thought it. Now Nuna said, I'm going over there. Keep Wehana in the house. Watch it. Wanadi may come looking for it. If he comes, say, I don't know anything. I haven't seen anything. Okay, said the sister. When the man left, the girl hid Wehana in her vagina, thinking, it's done. I'll keep them all in my belly. They'll be born. I'm going to be their mother. She rubbed her stomach. She was happy. 
she listened to the dancing and the shouts of laughter of one of these little people. They were going to populate the earth. When her brother returned, he looked for Juana. It wasn't there. He got angry, really angry. Did Juanadi come? Did he take it? I haven't seen anyone, she said. I don't know anything. He beat her. Then Nuna saw his sister's stomach. It was round as if she was pregnant. He just looked and looked. He knew what it was. Nuna didn't say anything. Frimene turned her back. She didn't want him to hear or see. I'm going, she said. I'm tired. I'm going to get in my hammock. She left. Night came. Now she was alone. She listened to her stomach. She listened to the voices and the drums, the songs and the horns. It was her children. She fell asleep. Then she woke up. She opened her eyes. She couldn't see anything. There was no sun. Everything was dark and quiet. She heard a dull sound. Very faintly. It was like steps. They were coming closer. She couldn't see. She just heard them. She was frightened. Who could it be, she thought. The steps were coming toward her hammock. They were coming very, very slowly. When they arrived, a big object like a body fell on the hammock. It was a man. That girl was scared. She didn't say anything. She didn't hear anything. Hands were moving all over her, landing here and there like bees on the girl's body. They were feeling and groping and searching. You could just barely hear Juana softly humming below. The girl squeezed her legs shut to protect her children. The hands tried to spread them open. Impossible. They couldn't. The sudden hand come up when the man jumped out of the hammock and went away. He didn't say anything. Just that sound. Like very, very slow steps. Now the sun rose. Then the girl got up. What happened, she thought. Was it a dream? Who was that? Was it Odosha? Was it Wanadi looking for his children? Or Nuna hungry? Now I'm going to find out. She went to find some karuto oil. She put it in a gourd. Now, in the memory of that time, our women paint the inside of their gourds with karuto oil. When night came, the girl painted herself. She painted her face, her legs, her entire body with karuto oil. She turned black with karuto. Then she got in her hammock and went to sleep. When she woke up, she heard the steps in the dark. They were slowly coming toward her again. The man fell on her. Hands were feeling and groping and searching. They took hold of the girl's legs. They wanted to force open her cave. They wanted Juana. The girl squeezed her legs shut. The people inside Juana were spun around. A hand reached up and touched Juana. It tried to grab it. The girl fought back. She started to bleed. She bled a lot. That's why our women bleed every time Nuna passes. As a reminder. When the sun came up, the girl jumped out of her hammock. She was alone again. Now I'm going to find out, she thought. She went out to look. On her way, she met her brother. Hiding in a field. Crouched down beside an animal trap. Don't make any noise, he answered. I'm hunting. I'm hunting some people. He was hunting people. 
as if they were animals. As he spoke, he showed his face. It was stained with karuto oil. His body too, his hands were all black with karuto oil. It was him, the girl said to herself. I found him. She didn't say anything, she just left. Now that girl thought, I can't live in Nunanya anymore. She went back home. She gathered up her things and she fled. Now Nuna has a stained face. When the moon is full, we look at the moon. We can still see those stains on his face. We're reminded of the beginning. I've seen them. You can too. That's the way the old ones tell it, okay? Now that woman fled into the jungle, her children in her stomach, her arms filled with gourds and baskets. She was running. The woman went on running and came to the Urinyaku, which we called the Orinoco. The river was big. She couldn't get across. Okay, she said, I can't get across. The water will be my path. She went into the water. She fled from her brother's house, swimming. She said, I am the water mistress. I am the river mother. Then she changed into Wi'io, the great snake, the water mistress. She went beneath the water and hid. You couldn't see her anymore. Now she built her house at the bottom of the rapids. The Orinoco River had just been born. All the rivers were just starting to flow then. Marahuaca, that tree, had just been cut down to feed the animal people. Now Huiio was born. She made herself mistress of the new water, which was flowing everywhere. Huiio was the great water snake. The great anaconda. Wanadi was angry. His huihana was stolen. He went looking for it. He asked the people. He went around asking. No one knew. He went to Nuna's house. He asked him about huihana. I don't know where it is, Nuna said. My sister knows. She has it in, hidden in her stomach. That's why she ran away at dawn. That's what Nuna told Wanadi. He told him to get back at her. He thought, this way, she'll be punished for taking Kohana away from me. When Adi went to find the girl, he called everywhere for her. Free Bene! Free Bene! She didn't answer. He asked the people, we haven't seen her, they said. Each one went on his way, looking and calling. Free Bene! Nothing. Then they got tired. They couldn't find her. They came back. Finally, Frimene came out of the water in the form of the great snake, Wi'io. She came out. When she came out, she heard the music from Huehana inside her belly. You could hear those children of Wanadi singing and dancing inside the snake's belly. They were waiting to come out. Mudo, Gwar said to the great snake, Wanadi wants you to give Wahana back. I can't, she answered. I have my children in. They're not yours. They're Wanadi's. She didn't want to give them back. Now Mudo and Hohutu called the people, yelling in every direction. Many came. They made bows and arrows and spears. Mudo and Hohutu were giving people orders. We'll catch her and kill her, they said. Now the first hunt began. They chased the eel, the, the great serpent, along the river. They could see the rainbow, the snake's feather crown, from far off. She was spreading her feathers in the air, drying them in the sun. There she is, the hunters shouted. They were looking at the rainbow. They were close now. They spoke to Day Day the bat. We want to shoot our arrows. They told him, going to kill that big snake and get Huihana out of her. 
You stay here and just watch quietly. When Wehana drops, catch it so it does not fall in the water. Okay, said Dede. I'll wait right here. The hunters went off to shoot the great snake. There were really a lot of them. They all shot at the same time. The arrows flew. Now we eel looked like a porcupine with all those arrows stuck in her body. She fell over. She died. She let go of Wehana. Wehana shot out in the air from her belly. Dede was watching, ready to catch Wehana with his fish net so it wouldn't fall in the water. Grab it, he shouted, don't lose it! Now Fisha, the cuckoo bird, came zooming in, headed straight for Dede. He had a long tail, he shoved Dede aside with that tail and took the fish net. Move over, he said, let me get that egg. Your eyes are too small, you can't see. There was a huge rock in the water. Hohanna burst on it. The unborn people flew all over the place. They didn't drown, they just turned into fish eggs. When the eggs opened, hundreds of fish came swimming out. They were the first fish. Crocodiles came out too, and caimans, and anacondas. All the animals you see today living in the waters, and lakes, the rivers. Weeo was the mother of them all. on the shore. She died there, covered with arrows. She didn't really though. She was too powerful. She just left her form, her body there. The rainbow is a reminder. Now she lives in the highest heaven in Lake Aquena. Now she is the mistress of Aquena, of eternal life. Her body remained on earth as a great snake. The animal people ate her. First came a jaguar called Manuwa. He took the first bite. His mouth was full of blood. Dadwiche! Dadwihena! I haven't eaten! I'm hungry! The others screamed when they saw the blood. They hadn't eaten meat yet. They had cut down Marawaka, the tree, the tree that gave them the yucca and the cassava and the manioc. But they had only eaten yucca and fruit. Now they started to hunt. That day, they ate meat. One after the other, they all came, right down to the smallest one, shoving and pushing to get a mouthful of meat. That we take. That we hina, we hunters scream now. We always remember that first hunt, the death of We Eo. When We Eo died, the rivers overflowed their banks. They flooded the villages. They flooded the entire earth. The people fled, running to the cliffs and the caves in the mountains. When the great water went down again, they thought, "We can go back now. There's no more danger." Then they went back and ate the great snake, the water mother. Mudo and Hohutu, the night birds, were those people's chiefs in the beginning. They gorged themselves with meat and went off one after the other. The blood-stained river was full of fish now. Wanadi's people weren't born, they were turned into fish. Only Manua the jaguar and his woman were left. The woman was looking at the blood on the rocks by the shore. She found two fish eggs. They were still dry. They had fallen on the rocks and hadn't opened. Those two escaped, said Manua's woman. I'll take care of them. I'm going to hatch them. I'll be their mother. Good said Manua. That way we'll have people, 
We'll have meat in the house. Manua's woman was called Kawao. She saved them both. Later, two boys were born. They were Hui'io's children, brothers of those fish people. That's what they said. That's how the old ones tell it. That's all now. Way back then, the people didn't know anything about fire. They ate their food raw. That woman, that toad woman, she had fire. She kept it hidden in her belly. She didn't show it to anybody, not even her husband. The woman was named Kawao. Whenever she wanted to, she turned into a toad. Her husband's name was Manua. When he went out to hunt, he changed into a jaguar. He ate humans. Kawao knew the secret of fire. She cooked like other women do now. She fried yuca, manioc, cassava. She boiled fruit. She roasted meat. She would hide whenever she did it. She waited till Manua went out hunting. When she was all alone, she opened her mouth and pulled the fire out of her stomach. She spit the fire under the food like that. Then she pulled in her tongue and swallowed the fire again. Then her husband came home. His food was ready. When he came in, he asked, How'd you do it? He didn't know. Oh, I did it with the heat of the sun, the woman answered. I just put the food out in the sun all, that's all. Oh, said the jaguar. He was very simple-minded. The woman had him fooled. The day they killed Huiwio, the water mother, Kawao found two fish eggs. They were abandoned by the shore. Take them, her husband said. Okay, she answered. And she took them home. She wanted to hatch them in order to have children. He wanted children too, so he could eat them. When she got home, she put the eggs near the hearth. It was a secret hearth. She blew her fire out there. The fire's heat opened the eggs. They weren't fish that were born. They were boys. The eldest one was named Shikimona. The younger one was Yureke. They were two powerful men. They grew very fast after they were born. Right away they walked. They talked. They ate. They weren't children anymore. They were the fish brothers. But they looked like people. They came out of Huehana with the fish. Kawao the toad found them. She adopted them. I'm your mother, she told them. She didn't tell them the true story about their mother, about their mother's death. They were wild, unruly kids. They ran all over, shouting and screaming and fighting. They raced a terrible ruckus. They asked a lot of questions, question after question. They were pests. They changed their forms every other minute. They played pranks on people just for the fun of it. First, they were boys, then fish, then crickets, then cockroaches. They made fun of Kawao. They didn't pay any attention to her. It was just like 400 kids inside that house. And they were only two. They liked going in the river. That's not good, said Madua. The fish will say something. They'll tell the kids the truth. Okay, said Kawao. I'll forbid them to go in the river. When they returned, she told them, I don't want you to go in the, in the water anymore. Okay, mother. They said, we won't go back. 
Then they asked for their dinner. Gawal sent them out to play. I want to be in here alone to cook. Okay, they said. We'll go. But they stayed. Then they said, Tell us how you do it. With what? What do you use to cook them? With the heat of the sun, she answered. No, it couldn't be with the heat of the sun, they said. You can't. Tell us the truth now. The woman got angry. She threw them out of the house. Now you'll be punished. I won't give you any food. They came in another door. Give us cassava, they said. Tell us how you do it. Kawal gave them a beating. Arr! When they left, they jumped in the water saying, Okay, we won't go back. We'll never go back. They went down with the fish, swimming just like fish. At the bottom of the river, they came to an enormous house. They called out, Hello? Nothing. No one answered. This house is empty, they said. Then they went in. Nice house, said the older one. I feel like I've been here, answered the other. They found two hammocks. They got in and went to sleep. As they slept, they dreamed. They saw Hui'i in their dream. The great snake said, This is my house. Your house. I'm your mother. Wanadi is your father. They've lied to you. That's not your house. Toad isn't your mother. The jaguar isn't your father. They killed and ate me. I live in Cahunia now. I just speak to you in dreams. Be careful with jaguar man. He wants to eat you. You'll have to kill him first. That's what the twins dreamed when they slept on the riverbed in Huio, their mother's house. When they woke up, they found a gourd filled with karuto oil. They picked it up. Now they dreamed again. This is my gourd, my karuto shimi, for painting myself. If you throw it out, the rivers will overflow. Water will cover the earth. You'll drown the bad people that killed me. The people that came to kill me were many. They came from all over, down to the smallest one. They all ate me. The boys woke up again. Okay, they said. One day we'll avenge our mother. We'll flood the entire earth. We'll drown all the people that killed her. We'll come back here and get the gourd. Then they hid it and swam away. Say, let's go back to Toad and Jaguar's house. They're not our parents. We'll fool them will punish them for our mother's death. On their way, they came to a rock. They got out there and rested like boys again. Above the rock, there was a tree. A beautiful branch was hanging down from it. There were beautiful yellowtail nests hanging from the branch. Lots of yellowtails were coming and going. Now the boys were looking at one of the nests. Konoto, the father of the yellowtails, was poking his head out of the nest entrance. Here we are, said Yureke. Do you live here on the river? Tell us how Hui'io, the mother of the fish, was killed. Konoto answered, Tiwa, Tiwa. That's the way he sang. That's the way Konoto sings today too. You can hear him. What did he say? Asked Yureke. Tiwa, Tiwa, he sang again. I don't understand yellowtail talk said Yureki. I understand, said Shikimona. He's saying Tiwa, Tiwa, shooting, shooting. That's the way the boys learned about their mother, how their mother had died. When they got back to Manua's house, they didn't go in. They just put their ears against the door and listened. They went back to the river, said Kawao. They don't listen. They just pester me with all their questions. Well, they're big now. If they discover the truth, they'll kill us. If they come back, kill them. Cut off their heads with scissors. Manua said, How can I do it? I raised them. 
They're my children now, Toad answered. Arrgh! I'm going out now to find Midi-Q to salt with. Make a broth, season it well. Get the meal ready. I'm going to look for Midi-Q. I'll be back soon, I'll be hungry, said Jaguar Man. He went out to find Ash to salt the boy's soup with. Okay, said Kawal. Now the boys came in through the other door. We're here, they said. We've been swimming. We're hungry now. Where's our dinner? There's no food, Kawal answered. We're hungry, they said. Give us some cassava. Tell us how you make it. No, you don't listen, answered Toad. She gave him a whack and threw them out. Okay, we're going, they said. The boys left. Now they made a plan. What should we do, one of them said. We'll discover the secret, said the other. We'll steal it. We don't want to be cooked in that soup. Okay, said Yureke. We'll go back in again and ask for our dinner. She'll throw us out. I'll hide inside the house. You go outside and make a lot of noise. She'll think we're both playing outside. I'll be hidden in the rafters of the roof, watching. That's how we'll find out. They went in. They asked for Kasabe. Kawal threw them out again. Only Shikimona left. Yureke hid up in the rafters of the roof. He wanted to find out Toad's secret. He took out one of his eyes. He stuck it in the back of his neck to see behind him. Kawal heard the noise that Shikimona was making outside. It sounded like two boys playing. Yeah, well, there was only one. Good. They're gone, Kawal thought. They're wrestling now. I'll make Kasabi. I better hurry before they come back in and bother me. Now she went to find her pan. Yureka's reflection was in it. She looked down at her pan. She turned her head towards the roof. Yureka was up there. What are you doing up there on the rafters? Didn't you go out with your brother to play? Get out! I want to be alone in here. I want to cook now. I can't, said Yureke. Look, I lost an eye. I can't see very well. I can't walk. I won't watch you. I'll turn around and face the ceiling like this. Turn around then, the woman said. Don't watch me, she told him. Okay, he answered. The boy turned around. I can't see anything now. Go on and cook. We're hungry. But he could see everything from the eye in the back of his neck. That's the way he tricked her. She opened her mouth. She blew the fire under the pan. It was really bright under the pan. The eye behind Yureka's head was blinded. He couldn't see anything anymore. Now Shikimona came up to the door. I want to come in now, he said. All right, the food is ready. Kawal shot out her tongue and scooped up the fire. She swallowed. She hid it in her stomach again. Come in, she told Shikimona. Come down again, she told Yureke. Come on down. The boy took the blinded eye out of the back of his neck. He put it in front again. He could see fine once it was back in its place. He could see the grilled manioc ready to be, to be eaten. And the boys asked, How did you make that food? Give us a taste. Kawao started hitting them. Arrgh! She wanted to eat alone in peace. And she ate without giving them any. She came on and whispered to his brother. What happened? What did you see? I saw a beautiful thing, Yureka said. It burns. It shines like the sun. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Let's steal it, they said. Let's take it from her. Now the woman came up with the scissors. Your hair is really long, boys. Here, come here. I'm going to cut it. Okay, mother, they answered and walked over quietly. They didn't say anything now. They were very still. Kawa didn't want to cut off their hair. She wanted to cut off their heads. She started cutting. At first, it made her sad. Her hands shook. Then she thought, my, my husband told me to. He'll be back soon. He'll be hungry. 
Hell asked for his meat. Kawal spread the scissors around Shikimona's neck. Yureka leapt up. He pulled the scissors away. He jumped on Toad. Now the two boys began kicking her and cutting her with the scissors. They squeezed her stomach. They opened her mouth. Ah, ah. They both screamed, throw it up. Take that thing out of your stomach. Kawal began to cough and spit. <laughs> she choked. She was suffocating. Now the fire caught in her throat. It was stuck. It wouldn't come out. The boy squeezed. Nothing. Spit it out. Throw it up. They screamed, kicking and cutting her. She coughed. <laughs> she couldn't get it out. The lump of fire got up to her throat. It swelled. It went back down. It wouldn't come out. Vomit it. Spit it out. They screamed. Then Shikihoma split open Toad's mouth with the knife. The fire gushed out. It burned Toad's back. It rolled onto the floor. Yureke pounced on it. He caught it. You let it out. They screamed. You threw it up. Ha <laughs> ha. Because of that, the Toads today, Kawao's grandchildren, all have wrinkled backs and wide mouths. They have a lump on their throat. Oh, 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 that goes up and down. Kawao's head was hanging from the slit on her throat. They gave it a little tug. The head fell off. That's the way the toad died. Cut the heads off with the scissors. Hmm. That's what Manua said. Said the boys. And they rock with laughter. <laughs> Make a broth. Season it well. Get the meal ready. Now we'll do that. We'll do just that. What Manua said. And they fell down laughing. Ha 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 ha. They cut up Toad. They blew fire under the pot. They picked up the head. They put it on the bottom and all the other pieces on top. Then lots of chili peppers. Now the pot sank. Bubbles formed at the broth as the boys cooked. Then they heard steps on the path as Manua came back, the jaguar man. They got up in a hurry. They hid the fire. They looked around for a spot. Here? There? No, no. Here's a good spot. No, no, there. There were two trees behind the house. Wishu is the name of one of them. Komunate is the name of the other tree. They hid the fire. Yureka hid one half in Wishu. Shikemona hid the other half of the fire in Komunate. We always remember that when we want to make new fire, we take Wishu and Komunate and we rub them each together, calling out all the time, fire, fire. Right away, the fire jumps out, it shines. Those boys kept it for us. They hit the fire in two trees in the beginning. Because of that, people eat well now. That's all. So that is the narration as it was told to the Sivriu, uh, translated into English by David Gus. Here I'll begin the comparative analysis of this portion of Watuna as it relates to Taino Chronicles. First of all, as we mentioned earlier, Wanadi and his several manifestations do present a portrait of a male creator deity, since he appears to create the first people who are later turned into animals. And later he dreams up the Hohana egg with his seminal souls of the later humans inside. However, I'm convinced that Wanadi's character here is strongly influenced by 500 years of interaction with Christian belief. And I feel that in ancient pre-colonial times, Wanadi may not have been as unilaterally influential in the creation process as he appears to be in this particular version of the story. This is hinted at by the fact that in spite of his apparent prominence in the act of bringing about the Wuhana egg, ultimately he's helpless in his ability to actually consummate the creation process. 
without a female protagonist. The Juana egg cannot be hatched without a female uterus. Ultimately, only when it is protected and nurtured inside the womb of the water serpent mother Frimeni, Huiyo, does the Juana egg finally hatch. Nuna, the malevolent cannibalistic male lunar deity, performs an interesting role in the story that is reminiscent of several mythological themes in Arawakan tradition. In the tradition of the Arawakan Lokonos of Guyana, there's a story collected by the researcher Walter Roth that tells of a sister and brother who lived together. The sister appears to be an archetypal female reminiscent of Atabe and Freemeni. The male is identified in the story as Moon Boy, which of course coincides with the lunar Nuna character of Makiritari tradition. Moon Boy becomes sexually infatuated with his sister and wishes to commit incest with her. He waits until she's asleep in her hammock at night and crawls into it with her, groping and accosting her. Unlike the Makiritari story of Freemania and Nuna, Moon Boy's goal is not to pry an egg out of his sister's vagina. His purpose is amorous. As a result of that, his approach is much more gentle. And not knowing who the boy is, his sister gives in to his amorous advances. The boy does this several times on succeeding nights, and the girl accepts these nocturnal visits eagerly. Eventually she becomes curious and wishes to find out who the mystery nighttime lover is. One night, she smears her body with the soot from the bottom of a pepper pot and awaits her lover. When the boy comes, she caresses him with her soot smeared hands on his face and body and ensures that she will be able to recognize him when the morning comes. Sure enough, at dawn, the girl goes out to look at the faces of all the boys and finds out that it is her own brother who has been visiting her at night. The whole thing is a huge scandal. Moon Boy is banished from the community and goes up to live in the sky, to dwell there by himself in shame. The stains of soot can still be seen on his face when the moon is full. And menstruation in some women can sometimes express itself in very painful and even dangerous forms as a result of their sin. In the case of the Desana people, whose territory lies between the Orinoco River Basin and the Amazon River Basin. The story is different. The Desana creation story was collected by the researcher Gerardo Rachel Domotov. In this story, the sun and the moon are brothers. The sun has a beautiful wife who is described as the spirit who safeguards healthy gestation of pregnant women and the growth of plants. In a sense, this female spirit could be identified with a beneficent female lunar deity of fertility. However, as I mentioned earlier, the Desana also recognized a more problematic male lunar entity, who is the brother of the sun. The moon brother is infatuated with the wife of the sun brother, and on certain occasions attempts to seduce her. His amorous advances are too forceful and cause the woman to experience harsh menstrual cramps and bleeding. Some of the menstrual blood stains the face of the moon brother before he flees from the scene. The harsh menstruation is so severe that the woman's husband must perform a healing ceremony over her to help her recover from the consequences of his brother's indiscretion. The sun brother punishes the moon brother by reducing the splendor of his glow, which is why the moon is now not as bright as the sun. The interaction between the female character and the male lunar character in these three stories are all very different, and especially we see the variation in the motivation of the male lunar spirit. In the Makiritari tale, his motivation is cannibalistic hunger, while in the stories of the Lokono and the Desana, it is simply lust. However, it's obvious that there are very similar themes that run at the base of all three stories. These common themes are one a male troublesome entity who is identified with the moon. Two, 
This male lunar entity has the power to cause unhealthy, harsh menstrual cramping and bleeding in females. Three, in at least two of the three stories, the female, who is affected by the actions of this problematic male lunar entity, is a motherly character associated with divine fertility. In a way, there exists a kind of dualistic tension between the beneficent uh, lunar quality of fertility inherent in the character of the female entity and the more problematic element of uterine illness inherent in the character of the male lunar character. One can be said to induce a more healthy form of menstruation while the other is the cause of abnormal bleeding and morbidity. A similar theme appears to exist in the name mentioned by the Spanish chronicler Ramón Pané in his written narration Relación acerca de las Antigüedades de los Indios, first composed in 1498, based on the information he collected from Taino informants on the island of Hispaniola. The name in question is Guacar. This name is found in the version of Panay's narrative translated by the Italian author Francisco de Ulloa, and also in the copies created by Pedro Martí de Anguera and Bartolomé de las Casas. Las Casas specifies that this name, Guacar, actually refers to a male divinity who is the brother of Yokahu, the Taino ancestral spirit of life and energy. Several modern day researchers agree that the linguistic analysis of the word Guacar renders the term Gua, meaning our, Ka, meaning strong or harsh, and Iri, something that happens on a monthly or lunar frequency and is associated with the marine tides. So Joseph Campbell suggests that the word may mean something akin to our harsh menstrual cramps. But it's nevertheless the name of a male lunar entity, much like the male lunar entities in the Locono, the Sana, and Makiritari legends. Obviously, the name mentioned in Taino mythology also suggests a spirit of problematic menstruation. We may assume that while the Taino divine female deity Atabe represents positive, healthy lunar menstrual energy, her son Guacar represents the dual opposite. It is also significant to note that as the brother of Yokahu, who is a solar entity dwelling in the heavens, the Taino harsh menstrual cramp spirit, Guacar, is a cognate of the moon brother in the Sana tradition, who also has the power to cause harsh menstruation cramps. As we move beyond the interaction between Frimene and Nuna, we must analyze the remarkable transformation of Frimene into a giant anaconda snake. When she dives into the Orinoco River, Frimene has assumed the role of divine mother spirit by inserting the Juana egg into her vagina. By doing this, she not only saves the unborn humans from being devoured by Nuna, but more importantly, she succeeds in the task that has stymied Wanadi from the very beginning. She finally provides a divine uterus where humanity can gestate. This element of the story has important parallels in the Taino creation story. In the Taino Chronicles, the version of the narration that has survived to the present time does not actually mention a general cosmic gestation in or a birth from Atabe's womb except for the fact that she is the mother of Yokahu. However, as I mentioned earlier, an analysis of her name implies that she is the mistress of the waters, much like Frimene, and that places her in the same category of an all-mother, female creator deity, that Frimene clearly is. As an all-mother creator spirit, she can be said to be an earth matriarch, just like Kwatliki from Aztec mythology and Pachamama of Inca mythology. As an earth matriarch, Atabe's body is identified with the earth itself, and thus an opening on the surface of the earth, such as a cave, can be interpreted to be the entrance into her vagina. This is precisely what is alluded to in the Watuna narrative, 
when the Makiritare informant is explaining Nuna's attack on Frimeni in her hammock, and he says that Nuna is trying to get his hand into her cave. This reference is of supreme importance because it clearly indicates that to the Orinoco region indigenous mind, the word cave can be used to describe the entrance to a woman's uterus. Returning to the Taino Chronicles, at least two references are made to caves in the creation story. One cave is called Iguanaboina, which has been interpreted by modern researchers to mean brown serpent. From this cave, it is said that the sun and the moon emerge. The other cave is called Casibahagua, and from this cave emerges all humanity. The Taino mind is on the same wavelength as the Makiritari mind. They recognize the earth to be a manifestation of the Divine Mother's body, and thus things were born from the womb of the earth, especially people, at the moment of creation. Human creation is perceived as a birth, just like it is in the case of the Makiritari. As in the case of the Makiritari water serpent mother, Frimene, Hiwio, the cave opening into Atabe's womb from which the sun and moon emerge bears a snake's name, Brown Serpent. In the Taino Chronicles, there is an episode in which four quadruplet boys, led by one called Deminan, are born from the womb of a woman who has been generally recognized by many modern day researchers to be a human manifestation of Atabe. This woman is called Itiba Kahubaba, and she dies in the act of giving birth to the quadruplets via cesarean section. Coincidentally, Frimene, the female deity of the Makiritari Watuna legend, also dies at the moment when she gives birth. And from that birth are born twin boys, Yureke and Shikemona. The birth of Yureke and Shikemona is a spectacular event in which the Huehana egg flies out of Frimene's serpentine body's ventral opening when she is killed by the animal people and breaks open on some rocks, releasing countless fish eggs, which then produce fish and other marine animals, and also the two twin boys. This forceful extraction of the Huehana egg from the snake's ventral opening can be interpreted as a kind of cesarean section operation, much like what happened to Itiba Kahubaba. And ultimately, it is interesting that both operations yielded multiple births. In the case of Itiba Kahubaba, it was four kids. In the case of Frimene, it was two kids. The coincidences do not stop there. In the story related in Panay's narrative, Deminan and his three brothers appear to present a rather raucous and irreverent attitude, breaking into the house of tribal elders uninvited and helping themselves to food that is there without per their permission. This behavior by the Taino multiple birth boys is reminiscent of the behavior exhibited by the Makiritari multiple birth boys, Yureke and Shikemona, who likewise are extremely loud and bothersome and drive their foster mother Kawao, the toad woman, crazy, demanding food and asking problematic questions. This element of the Makiritare story has inspired many, many modern day researchers to make a direct connection between the Orinoco narrative and the Taino narrative. The Orinoco narrative clearly casts the foster parents of Frimene's twin sons as true villains. Kawao, the toad mother, is violent and cruel to her adopted sons, sometimes withholding nourishment from them and beating them when they're too bothersome. Her husband, Manua, the jaguar man, is intent on having the boys for dinner. 
and he urges his wife to cut off their heads and serve them to him in his meat broth. She almost succeeds in doing just that. The boys naturally are cast as heroes. They defeat both Kawao and Manua, and eventually steal the secret of fire and food cooking from the toad woman, who up to this point has selfishly withheld the secret of cooking from the rest of the earthly beings. Yureki and Shikimona generously share the secret of fire and food cooking with the rest of the world. Modern researchers such as Sebastian Robiula March have suggested that the actions of Deminan and his brothers are a parallel to this and that their uninvited entry into the home of the shaman, Bayamanako, constitutes a similar quest to acquire fire and food cooking from a reluctant, selfish elder. I believe that this stretches the parallel between the two narrations just a little too far. I agree that the Deminan quadruplets are the Taino version of the Makiritara twins, and their adventure are very similar. But there is no indication in the Taino chronicles that Bayamanako is intentionally withholding food from them. It is true that the Minan and his brothers barge into the home of Bayamanako and demand cassava bread from him, addressing him by the title grandfather. But this does not necessarily mean that Bayamanako is an actual relative or even an adopted guardian of the four boys, the way that Kawao and Manua were to the Makiritare twins. The grandfather title may just as well be an honorific title used commonly by indigenous people all over the world to address elders, any elder. As for their request for food, I admit that it is not honored, and instead, Bayamanako unceremoniously blows a wad of mucus on Deminan's back instead of giving him cassava bread. The boys have disrespectfully barged into his house, just like they barged into the home of Yaya, and helped themselves to the fish and the funerary gourd hanging there. The Minan deserved the treatment he got from Bayamanako. I don't think that Bayamanako's reaction can be compared to the constant cruelty of Kawao or the threat of being cooked and eaten by Marua. Lastly, there is no evidence at all that the De Minan quadruplets forcibly stole either fire or the secret of cooking from a reluctant or selfish Bayamanako in the way that the Makiritar twins did from the frog woman. On the contrary, an independent Taino researcher suggests that Bayamanako voluntarily shared the skills of cooking as well as many other fire-related abilities with the Deminan quadruplets in the form of a gift imparted to incipient humanity through Deminan. Those skills allowed humans to develop and evolve and become a successful species. That said, all of the other comparisons between the Deminan quadruplets of the Taino mythology and the twin sons of Rimene in Makiritare mythology demonstrates amazing similarities. In the Taino chronicles, the quadruplets break into the home of an elder called Yaya while he is busy in his cultivated fields tending his garden. They take down a large gourd that hangs by long cords from the rafters of the elder's ceiling. Inside the gourd, the elder has enclosed the bones of his dead son, Yajael, but these bones have turned to fish, and the fish are swimming around in a pool of seawater inside the gourd. The Minan and his brothers set to work eating the fish until they hear Yaya returning to the house. Since they have broken into the house without permission, they hastily attempt to rehang the gourd from the rafters as they make their escape, but fail to do so successfully. The gourd falls and the water inside pours out in miraculous torrents, filling up all of the low places of the earth, creating the Caribbean Sea and populating it with fish. There are several episodes of the Makiritane Watuna story that appear to be parallels to this particular portion of the Taino's sacred narrative. First, right after the killing of the snake mother, Frimene or Hiwiu, there's a prodigious flood that sends the animal people fleeing to higher ground. At the same time, the egg breaks on a rock, scattering a multitude of fish eggs that populate the, world, the waters of the world with many fish. The investigator Ryan Martin 
presented a research paper titled Ceremonial Offerings and Religious Practices Among the Taino Indians, an Archaeological Investigation of Gourd Use in Taino Culture, at the IUSB Undergraduate Research, Research Conference in March of 1999. In this presentation, Martin indicated that the ritual use of an Iguera gourd in which the bones of deceased member of the community are interred, suggests a return of the soul of the dead person to the womb of the mother deity. The gourd is a metaphor for an uterus, especially since it is filled with seeds that offer potential new life. In her publication, The Bat and the Guava, Proviones Bishop proposes the earth where the dead plants return and where dead vegetation rots as a recycling center for life in a kind of reincarnation paradigm, and a metaphor for the womb of the earth mother. The fish, like the seeds, represent potential or future life and future births. Sebastián Rubio Lamarche makes a connection between fish migrations and ceremonies for the dead in the autumn season, which include the use of gourds among the Taino. So, the Juana egg in the Maquiritare legend, which obviously suggests an uterus, in itself can be compared to a gourd, which also suggests an uterus. When the Juana egg falls and breaks upon the death of Frimene, and when the fish are scattered all over the place during the Makiritari Great Flood, there is a direct parallel between the Nat narrative and the episode in the Taino Chronicle of the gourd breaking and causing the creation of the Caribbean Sea and the population of the sea with fish that came out of a funerary gourd. New life arises out of death. Later, when Frimene appears to her twin sons in a dream as they sleep during the first visit to her underwater house, she suggests that they find her old Karuta gourd there in her house and use it as a weapon to punish those who would harm them. All they have to do is throw the gourd and break it, and a great flood will ensue, which will drown their enemies. As I indicated at the very beginning of this video, the Orinoco River is the birthplace of Taino tradition, and so it is not surprising that among the indigenous people of that region, we can find many reflections of our Caribbean indigenous past.